Let us all rise and worship our Lord God Almighty. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Father, we gather here today before you this morning to sing praises and worship you and to be in your presence. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts with joy as we come together to exalt you, feast upon your words, and fellowship with you. In your gracious name we pray. Let's confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Heavenly Father, who created heaven and earth, who knows everything what we did, and wants to have close relationship with us. We came over today to worship you, Lord. Thank you for guiding us in the previous week. Thank you for providing everything what we need for living. Thank you for the overflowing love so that we can love and help each other in our daily life. Please forgive us foolishness, which blocks our, your way from us. Please forgive our careless tongue, which can hurt friends and family, eventually ourselves. Please forgive us being lazy to search your words, which is the most important every day. Here we are, Lord, in your body. As you speak through past on, please give us clean minds and gentle hearts. May the Holy Spirit help us to get our own words today. Bless our church. Bless every member. We belong to each other, belong to our community church. As you continue to live, as we continue to live a life by loving and serving one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's do the offering. Father, we come to you with offerings in our hands. May it be used for your kingdom and your glory. We thank you for providing for our daily needs. We thank you for our work and family. Let us not come to you empty-handed, but always as a response to your gracious love. Bless us throughout this week as we continue to live as faithful stewards. In your gracious name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Some announcements. Um, Friday Praise Night is coming this Friday, 7.30. And um, from the Mission Ministry, um, Nepal Vision Trip is underway. Please contact Han Lee for details. Um, there are about three uh, people who have signed up, and we're going to have a gathering soon. So if you're still interested, you haven't decided, but just want to know some of the details, you're welcome to come when uh, the date is noted in the future. And just to thanks to all the volunteers who supported the Relative Picnic for Foster Kids, hosted by Faith in Motion. I do have some um, couple pictures prepared. If you 
could have it on the screen. Yesterday, um, we went to Santa Ana Zoo uh, with the ministry team, and uh, I think three families kind of came and helped. Yeah. And um, our church prepared popcorn and snow cones, as we annually do. Um, this is a picnic just supporting uh, foster kids who have relatives, and it's just an opportunity for the relatives to engage with some of the foster kids so that they could probably decide, hmm, maybe we'll take them in. So yesterday the, in the morning it was cloudy, but in the afternoon, um, sunshine. So in the morning, popcorn was some of the favorites, but in the afternoon it changed into snow cones. <laughs> so we had a great time. Thank you for supporting. And um, just to, uh, I guess, promote this idea, uh, we do have some, no, not some, we have a lot of leftover popcorn. So we're going we're gonna to provide it for the church after the uh, 11 o'clock service. And I hope snow cones will be available too. Um, so enjoy and um, prayers for this as we continue to serve our community. Okay. Um, from Mokjang Ministry, there is, uh, it's June, so um, June is dedicated to uh, Joy Mokjang, and um, they're supporting missionary uh, Songu Kim, who is currently serving at the Phili Philippines, okay? So prayers for um, Kim Songu uh, missionary, and also for Joy Mokjang. Also, the cell group leaders meeting is coming June 20th. So if you are a leader, have that in your calendar. Educational department, um, we are still currently in search of a pastor to serve elementary. And we have um, Pastor Min Young Kim, who's sitting way back over there. And um, she's going to be uh, preaching at the elementary as one of the candidates. So hello. <laughs> Um, family worship, uh, third Sunday, uh, coming June 21st, as we did last time, a 9 o'clock um, EM service is going to be family worship. So um, if you are parents, have that in your calendar too, so we could have a worship with all of our children. Also, um, Training ministry, Bible study, uh, visual Bible, Acts, is starting today. It's going to be a six-week study uh, through the book of Acts, so, and it's going to be at the youth worship room in Korean, okay? Also, um, Living Life subscription, if you are receiving Living Life and um, you want to do it continuously for the following year, or you just want to start up, uh, please contact um, Elder Chang Ho-oh, okay? And also, we have a, a good news. Um, Edwin and Grace Vieira, uh, they had a newborn baby boy, and his name is Ryan. He looks very like Edwin, I think. Um, he's very healthy, so please uh, pray for the family. Okay. Also, um, Wednesday intercessory prayer and scripture reading. Um, they're going to have a summer break starting this week, so it's, we're not going to gather there. Okay, that's it. Um, let's go to our scripture for today. It's Genesis chapter 24, verses 10 to 27. Okay. Genesis chapter 24, verses 10 to 27. Uh, let's read alternatively. I'll read first. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram Naharaim and made his way to the town of Nahor. Then he prayed, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. <clears throat> 
May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a gold nose ring weighing a becca and two gold bracelets weighing ten shekels. She answered him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son that Milcah bore to Nahor. Then the man bowed down and worshipped the Lord, saying, Praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master as for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. Amen. Well, it's a long text. Actually, um, the text scripture designated for this Sunday is all of chapter 24. So I had to decide on which part that uh, I want to do my sermon. And it's interesting. Um, it's, it's a wedding chapter. You know, it's a matchmaking chapter. And it is the longest of all the chapters of Genesis. Among the 50 chapters, this chapter especially is the longest. And it is in detail. The, the, Abraham sends his servant, an unnamed servant, uh, which I'll probably go in a little more deeper later. An unnamed servant, um, Abraham sends, and he is sent to his hometown. And you know where Abraham came from. You know, he is currently living in the land of Canaan. Uh, but he came from Ur, and Haran is his um, hometown. It's about 500 miles. And we remember in Scripture that when Abraham was 75 in chapter 12, that he is called by God, leave your family, your everything, um, your hometown, just leave. And I will show you to a place where you will be blessed and nations will come out from there. And, and, and Abraham's journey is about leaving his hometown and learning who God is, the God who called, the God who is above families, possessions, anything that he thought was valued in life. And that was Abraham's journey. And last week through chapter 22, you know, um, when God is asking Abraham to offer Isaac the prize of God's blessing, you know, the fruit of his spiritual and faith journey, you know, the, the test is, Offer Isaac too against God's command, uh, God's promise, even though they're clashing. God wanted Abraham to choose God and trust in Him. Even though it doesn't make sense, choosing God made everything understandable. So we followed Abraham's journey for a while. 
And, and after that, what happened was in chapter 23, Sarah dies, and Abraham is 137 years old. So if you think of that, you know, a lot of things happened. So after three years, now Abraham is, you know, getting a little anxious maybe. He's getting old. Now he's 140 today in this scripture. Um, Isaac is 40, right? Because Abraham had Isaac when he was 100 years old. So Abraham, you have a 140 uh, old man, and you have a 40-year-old son who is not married yet, who cannot, you know, uh, continue on the promise of God. So Abraham is asking one of his servants. Actually, he was in charge of all the household. So he's probably the chief of staff. Okay. So he's asking the servant to specifically go to his hometown. You can't choose anyone from the daughters of Canaan. You have to go to my hometown. It has to be among my family and bring her back. Bring her back. And the servant, you know, in the previous verses, if you go there, um, they talk about what if she doesn't want to come? You know, it's a 500-mile journey, and we don't have, like, cars at that time, so it's not going to be an easy trip. And she has to leave her family, her relationships, all her memories. You know, she just has to leave. What? Just because you said so? Okay. Why would Abraham... Request this because a wife suitable for Isaac must have a faith that Abraham had. And think about it. Abraham left his hometown, left all his family, relationship, and everything. Why? Because he had heard the word of God. So among his family, would there be someone like the faith that Abraham, that just by listening to the word of God, would that person, that beautiful girl to be Isaac's wife, have the same faith of leaving everything because God said so? So if you think about that, Rebecca, when she meets the servant and the servant is telling all of what happened to Abraham and why he came here and how he met Rebekah, her deciding to leave is actually a reconnection of the next generation of faith where she starts to follow God because of his word and trusting him. But with this story, who makes this happen? Who makes this yearning of Abraham a reality? It's the servant. And many people want to think, who is the servant? We don't have a name for it. But many people think his name is Eliezer. And we have that in chapter 15. Okay, in chapter 15, um, if you want to go to chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, after this, so this is after a lot of things happened. Lot, his nephew, left. Um, they couldn't be with his uh, uncle Abraham. They had a fight. So you choose. You go left. I'll go right. You go right. I'll go left. Whatever. And they chose to leave. And now they were captives. And Abraham, um, he went to save Lot and his family. Okay? And he's coming back. And he met Melchizedek. He was blessed and all these things. After this, what happened was, uh, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. And God said, do not be afraid, Abram. So this is before Abraham was even named Abraham. He was Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. We don't know who this person is, but we think that when Abraham left Ur, Haran, and he's coming to um, Canaan, 
you know, he discovered this man named Eliezer from Damascus, and he became Abraham's servant. We know from Scripture that he had 318 warrior-like servants. And um, Abraham, as he's traveling away, he would extend hospitality. You, know, you don't want to join my family? You want to be part of what I'm doing? Just join in. And one of them was Eliezer. And he was Abraham's servant from the beginning of his faith journey. But if you think about this, you know, in today's scripture, the title of my sermon is My Master, My Master. And um, I intentionally did that because uh, the scripture that we just read in uh, uh, verse, you know, verses in the chapter of 24, you have my master, Abraham, my master, Abraham, my master, Abraham. This servant has faith, but along Abraham's faith journey, his faith is his master's faith, meaning Abraham knew the Lord, but it's like the servant, he's observing this, and he sees that the Lord is alive and true and, and indeed blessing his master. He's just great that he's involved in being a part of Abraham's family. He's just glad that he's just a part of God's plan and vision. So now Abraham is entrusting the servant to go and do the things that Abraham should have done but could not do because of his old age. My master, God of my master, Abraham. This is repeatedly stated in today's text. And I was pondering on the thought because actually after what happens today in Scripture, God does not stay as my master's God. It becomes his God. And I think this is what faith means. We should meet my master, Jehovah, the Lord, my God, not my pastor's God, not my mother's and father's God, not my friend's God, but my God. We hear a lot of testimonies about what God had done to certain people and God, how God had, you know, guided them. But today's text, this servant start out as, you know, I'm doing this for my master Abraham. My master Abraham's God is providing everything. But toward the end, it becomes an experience for Eliezer, if we think that he is Eliezer, that it is now his Lord, his master, who had guided him to complete this task. A realization that our individual faith, our personal relationship, is what God is trying to put into our hearts. Brothers and sisters in Christ, have you met my master? Have you met my Jesus? Or are we still influenced by, well, that person talks about God a lot, that person's testimony seems very um, fascinating. Well, it seems like it works for him or her, but is God for me? Scripture says very plainly, yes, he is for us. He is my master. And I hope that as we go through these passages that it will not be, oh, it's Abraham's servant's God. But we will go also into a realm where we can all confess that, yes, 
Jesus is my master. So some of the things um, we note from today's verse is this. He, he has a task of finding a bride for his master's son, Isaac, and he's leaving. And he took 10 of his master's um, camels and going back to a 500-mile trip to the hometown of Abraham. And, um, I mean, if you, were, if you were Abraham's servant, let's just call him Eliezer, you know, what were going through your mind? Remember, in chapter 15, Abraham thought that I have Eliezer of Damascus. I am satisfied. You told me that through me, nations will come out and I will be blessed but I don't have a son, a heir, an heir to, to, um, for your promise to be fulfilled. But I have Eliezer. So along these time, uh, Abram noted that this servant is very trustworthy. And uh, he's satisfied that even your blessing goes through him. It's okay. But God, after this conversation, said, no, I'm going to give you a son. So think about what's going through Eliezer. You know, you were probably a candidate for the future heir of Abraham and all his possessions. And then you hear God saying, no, I'm going to give you a real son. The heart of Eliezer is he was true to his master. And through the 65 years that he had been with Abraham, he knew that God was really true. And when his master is knowing about God and the promises that was made to him is becoming fulfilled, he observes in awe, yes, God is there. My master's God, my master's Yahweh, he's there. He prepares, he's a shield, he provides, he guides, and he is faithful. He learns about that. And going on this 500-mile trip, he knows how important his task is. He thinks about this. What an important task I have. Nations will come through my master's son Isaac. The promise of God will continue, and I am a matchmaker for this task. A matchmaker. When I was thinking about that, that's one of the roles that we have in Christ. Once we understand that God is there and that through him we have been given this faith, God wants us to also extend our influence to others so that we become matchmakers, so that the promise of God is continued. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. Even the mighty apostle Paul, he understands his ministry as a matchmaker. You think about Eliezer, a lot of things going on. I might have been the one, but I'm not. And he submitted to God's will. He understood that there is this God who gives life. And through Isaac, that great things will happen. He's just thrilled that he's just a part of that. But now he is going to be a matchmaker. 
and he is going to introduce a wife that will keep this promise going. So he's traveling and thinking, where should I go? So the best, you know, practical thing would be women, girls, they're always at the well. That's like their job at these ancient times to provide water for the families. And my camels are thirsty anyway. So I will go to the well, and from there, I will find a wife for my master's son. Well, that's exactly what he did. But Eliezer, you, you find something very interesting here. As he is calling God my master's God, my master's my master Abraham's God, he learned how to pray. And you see that in verse 12. Then he prayed. When he came to the uh, draw water, uh, when he came to the well and he saw many people drawing water, he prayed there. Oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, See, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. So this is what he suggested. Okay, I'm going to ask somebody, I'm going to say to a girl, hey, I want a drink. Please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And if she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too, let her be the one you have chosen for your servant, Isaac. One of the interesting uh, things that I re find here is there's nothing miraculous. You don't see Red Sea parting. You don't see where, like when we were reflecting on uh, living life yesterday, Saturday morning, where when dry land and water is just pouring in because of Elisha. You don't see those things. It's just everyday thing. But Eliezer learned through his master how he learned to pray. And that is praying for everything, expecting that God will work in our everyday day menial things. Everyday small things, God is there. And his prayer is understanding that God is everywhere and everything has meaning and the purpose. So he's just praying, you know, it's natural. You were sitting at a well and you're probably going to ask, can I have some drink, right? And he's praying with that process. And reflecting on that, do we have this faith in God? where God truly works in our everyday things, small things that we do. And, and his prayer connects everything. And through this prayer, he could see a totally different world where people do not pray. Because people who do not pray don't see how God provides and how God works in our everyday things. People who do not pray and ask God to be with us in our everyday things are losing something very important. And that is God is here with us 24-7. Well, this is the prayer that he asked. And what's interesting here is in verse 15, before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. It's like you, you just started praying and things are already happening. And this is the God that we believe. Okay? In Isaiah 65, 24, the Bible says, Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Think about this. Who is God trying to approach? It's not Abraham. It's Eliezer who keeps calling God my master, Abraham's Lord. God is trying to connect with Eliezer. I am here with you, with your prayers. I am here with you. 
God is also speaking to us. I am not God of only Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am not just God of Moses in the Bible. Don't think this is irrelevant. I am the God who is alive and speaking to you. Why do you not converse with me in your everyday things? And I will open your eyes. I am already here to answer you, to respond to your call. But where are you? Just talking about Abraham's God. Just talking about my master's God. When I want you to call me my Lord, my master, my God. If I could pull up the people like Abraham, don't you think I could pull up a person like you, Eliezer, a servant, a man from Damascus? Pray and you will know. Lean toward me and I will show you. Ask and it will be given to you. I am alive. I am not the God only of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am your God. Call on me. When he was just praying, this happened. And he asked this girl, would you please give me a little water from your jar? Okay. Drink, my Lord, she said. And quickly, quickly, this is repeated two times. It's like this girl, she's ready to do anything. A typical water jar contains about three gallons of water. So if you have picked up a gallon, it's about three times. So she's, ha she's carrying this, probably for her family. Now this stranger asked for the water, and she is willingly giving it to him. I'm going to shift a little here to Rebecca. Okay? After she had given him a drink, she said... I'll draw water for your camels too until they have finished drinking. Now, um, Eliezer brought 10 camels, if you've followed with me, okay? And a uh, typical camel, if it's really thirsty, he can drink up to 30 gallons of water, okay? Think about this, okay? You're Rebecca. Okay, this stranger asks, can I have a drink? Okay, have a drink. And I'll feed your camels too. Ten camels. Whoa, 30 gallons. 300 gallons. 300 times she has to go to the well to feed the camels. Somebody calculated this as maybe a two-hour thing. Uh, as a father of two children, I have a very hard time to get one of them to get me a drink. I moved from a um, one-story to a two-story, and all the bedrooms in the two-story. So when I go up, I always try to remember to carry my water cup up because when I go there, no one wants to come up to my room to give me just water. Dad, you have legs. Come on. You can just come down here. I mean, so even when we're all up, uh, we're just looking at one another, who's going to go down? And the first person who goes down, we just ask, why the way, when you're going down, could you give me some water? <laughs> okay. Rebecca, she's going to water 300 gallons of water <laughs> quickly, diligently, without a word. And she didn't even have to do it. She suggested it. She probably knew what it meant. Hard labor, just doing that. And you see Eliezer. He's just awed that he was just starting this prayer and the, and the girl just comes up to him. And when he just asked that, you know, she's just doing it quickly, quickly. What an awesome God. But is she the one? She looks beautiful. And then in verse 21, without saying a word, the man watched her closely. 
to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Eliezer, his learning about God's providence, how God prepares for everything. And um, there's one important um, factor that I kind of found from this scripture is when we offer hospitality, when we voluntarily do a random act of serving one another, something special is happening. Maybe somebody prayed about that occasion, but when we just voluntarily open this thing up, things happen. And I think that's one of our uh, values of hospitality, the H in reach over there. Hospitality is opening up room. It's opening up a room to share things I have. A Christian hospitality is not because I can provide this. A Christian hospitality is because I know that I need the Lord and you need him too. Rebecca is opening up her areas to serve this stranger. And what's interesting is she is actually helping Eliezer to know that it is his master at work. Without saying a word, she's just watching. He's just watching. Um, She's um, going uh, from the well to the camels for about a couple hours. He's just watching her. In her faith, face, she sees not a reluctant face, but a face filled with joy, something she's doing because she likes to do it. She, she's filled with the satisfaction that she's serving someone and, and by nourishing uh, the camels and even the stranger that, he's, that she's doing something good. Eliezer is looking at all of this and understands, wow, m- my master's God, my master's Lord, How awesome is he? Then he asked, you know, whose daughter are you? Who are you? And he finds out it's from the family of Abraham. She's the one. And with this, now we're coming to the conclusion. Verse 26. Then the men bowed down and worshipped the Lord. I want to believe this is a shift from worshiping my master's Lord to my Lord. I want to believe that Eliezer now has finally experienced that even through him, God works. All along, he was just observing, watching carefully how God is protecting Abraham, how God speaks to Abraham, how God has blessed Abraham. From a distance, he had watched it. But now, through Abraham, he is now a participant, not only a participant, but now he experiences that, yes, God answers my prayers. Yes, God is there. Yes, I'm here to do Abraham's task, but yes, he is here. I can see that God is here. He listens to my prayers. Eliezer is not worshiping the God of Abraham. He's worshiping his God, my master, my Lord. 
in verse 27, I kind of was went back because, you know, praise to be the Lord, the God of my master, Abraham. Is he going back to the same thing that, uh, that he always had confessed? Going back to my, my, my master's Abraham. This is probably something that was habitually into his confession of God who has not abandoned his kindness and faithful to my master as for me, okay, as for me, the Lord, my Lord, Eliezer's Lord, has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. Brothers and sisters, God is our Lord, and He is here for us. When we read Scripture, always, I hope you pull the God and the Scriptures out and worship Him as my Lord, not as my master, Abraham's Lord, or Moses' Lord or Paul's Lord, or John's Lord, but the Lord who is here for us. He will always be for us, and he will always guide us into his vision for his kingdom. And I plea with you that let's worship him. My Lord, my God. Let's pray together.